We teach people to live by a guiding question. We say it's just simple to ask, what does love require of me in this situation? So we're talking about anger today as we're in the middle of our uh, series on kind of safeguarding your heart and what are enemies of the heart. And one of the enemies of the heart is the idea that, that uh, there's anger and it can possess us, it can take over us, it can fill us and destroy us. And so here's kind of where we want to start with this idea. Uh, how many of you have been angry in the last week? Very good, very good. How many of you just lied because you've been angry but you didn't want to raise your hand? <laughs> oh, man, anger, it is like an enemy that will just, it, it'll grab you, it'll take hold of you. In fact, we're going to read in just a moment, Paul says it'll give Satan like a, a, an entry into your heart. An entry into your heart. Heart. That's pretty serious. And so we got to safeguard our heart from anger. We got to safeguard our heart from anger. And what I want to do is I want to just give a couple of examples of when you get angry. How many of you? How many of you were angry at traffic this week? Yeah. Some of you are like, I'm going to point at my spouse, but then I would be in trouble later. So you're not going to, right? But you know, you're right with that person, and they're like chewing out the person in front of them who really isn't responsible for anything that's going on because it's the 17th car in front of them that's responsible, right? But they're like, what's wrong with you? Don't you know how to drive? You've been with that person? There's a little bit of anger there. No point fingers now. There's no need. <laughs> Yo, you're claiming you, okay? <laughs> Well, you can do that. Confession at the altar will be done later. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and there's, a, there's anger. Uh, I, I get angry when they mess up my order. Do you have that anger issue? Like they mess up your order and you're just frustrated. And you're like, oh my gosh, I ordered this and not. And then you do that game if you're like me, like do I drive back or not, right? Do I just give up on it or do I drive back, right? And, and then there's the other places I get angry. I get angry when I'm late, and the sad thing about being angry when I'm late is it's, no, it's Sarah's fault. You obviously aren't at our house. It's Sarah's fault that we're late, okay? <laughs> I can say that. She's not here right now, all right? So, so there's anger that like, I, I kind of like self-impose. And, and let me just say that I kind of have uh, some history with anger. In fact, some of my history is... Uh, when I was going through my divorce, I remember uh, walking out to my barn, and we have a punching bag in the barn that I put up kind of for situations like this. And one day, something really bad had happened, and I remember going out, and I remember just beating that punching bag until my knuckles were bloody. That's anger issues right there. Like, you can't even feel how bad it hurts anymore. And I remember sitting with my counselor that later that week, and he's like, what happened to your knuckles? And I went, I was angry. And he goes, what did you hit? And I was like, well, there's a punching bag in our barn. And he looked at me and he smiled and he goes, good job. <laughs> and, and we get angry, right? And then what we do with our anger sometimes determines whether anger is okay or not. And how we live with that and how we deal with that can make a world of difference. Now, before we go any further, I just want to stop here. And, and, and because somebody asked me this week, they said, why is your church talking about anger? Like, don't you have enough about Jesus to talk about? And here's why we talk about anger. It's because we are people of grace. Everybody say, I'm a person of grace. Right. And when a person chooses to follow Jesus, God wants to transform every part of their life. And, and in the midst of doing that, Jesus makes this statement that the world will know that we are his disciples and we follow him because of our love. It's the correct English. Right? And anger, while it is not the opposite of love, sometimes prevents love from being seen. And so here's why we're talking about anger. is because it's an enemy of the heart that gives Satan a footstool in. It's an enemy of the heart that causes us to behave in inappropriate ways. And because grace is always transformative, it never leaves us as we are. And so there's this idea that we have an enemy that's anger, and we have to conquer that, and we have to learn to be mature about our anger. In fact, just a real check. If your spouse or a good friend of you were here today, would they say you're angry a lot? Or would this be the way it is? If someone told you you have anger issues, would that make you angry? 
I'm just saying, because I literally this week, I was with a dude, and I said to him, I'm like, you know, it seems to me like you got some anger issues. And he goes, you know, that upsets me you said that. In fact, it kind of makes me angry. And I was like, here's your sign, right? I mean, I was like, okay, and then you got to, you know, listen to what I'm saying. It's interesting, though, because did you know we're in what uh, a psychologists and counselors are calling an anger epidemic? An anger epidemic. Think about it. Everywhere in politics, it just seems like everybody's angry, right? The middle ground's gone. Everybody's angry all the time. In fact, uh, Bill Vincent writes that there is a crisis of the family of the institution of common decency. It's like there's no such thing, right? And he says, if we do not learn how to address the anger epidemic, he actually says this, the family, the marriage, the nation even, will be destroyed. He said, we just live at a constant state of I'm anger, I'm angry, I'm angry, I'm angry. And guess who feeds into that? It's going to be a shocker. It's your media. Didn't know that, did you? They want to keep you in two states. Fear and anger. Fear and anger. So what, what are some of the side effects of anger? Real quick, just side effects of anger. Did you know that anger can cause headaches? Digestion problems? A lot of, pe- a lot of people that are angry talk about, <clears throat> my stomach always hurts. Anger can cause insomnia. Think about it, last time you were really angry and you tried to go to bed, did it work? Or did you sit up at night just replaying the reel over and over again? And Boy, the next time I see them, I tell you what. Good thing I don't run into them in a dark alley, right? That's just kind of what you're thinking in your head, right? Come on now, all right? And we have depression, right? High blood pressure when you're angry. Did you know that it messes with all the chemicals in your body, all right? And then anger can also lead to, like, skin problems. I didn't know that one. Heart attacks. There's a lot of people who live angry, and they're just kind of go, hey, you're just kind of on high alert all the time, right? And, and it leads to heart attack, stroke, and even death and even death so in one sense we got to cover this because grace calls us to live difference in another sense we go hey this is just for your normal health one more place that we need to stare at did you know their entire families built around anger entire families and entire family system in fact uh they didn't make it here this Sunday because of the snow. Well, we, were, we had a small skit that we were going to do. And, and we were going to have a child being hollered at by, by his father. And then we were going to walk through the life of that child as he grew up. And he learned to yell at, guess who that child, when he gets married, learns to yell at? His children and his wife. And why? Because there are systems that we teach. This is how we deal with. And then we... Learn to just respond that way to everything. In fact, there are individuals whom this is the only way we know how to respond to anything. Sarah and I are reading a book on marriage right now, and it, it talks about there are, there, are, there are places where anger is the only emotion that we know how to express, even though that's not what we're really feeling even. Because we're not mature enough with our emotions to identify, this is what I'm really feeling. I'm really feeling hurt. And instead of just going, I'm hurt, we go, I'm just angry. Let's fight. And it's like that person's always looking for the next scrap. And therefore is always looking for the next person who wants to hurt them. And then they're going to hurt them back. Now, you see, if you live that way, no matter what you say about Jesus, or no matter how many times you sing in the bar or on the street, or if your friends, Jesus loves me, this I know, if you're angry all the time, they would go, yeah, but it hasn't done anything to you. There's no transformation that's taken place. And so we got to address this idea of anger and address it in an appropriate way, which leads us to Ephesians 4. Paul writes the book of Ephesians. If you got a Bible, go there. If you got your e-vice, open that up. Ephesians 4. Now, Ephesians is an interesting letter. A lot of people believe that Paul wrote this letter while in jail to the church of Ephesus. And Paul writes this letter to the church kind of saying, this is how we live. This is how we behave as a church. This is how we move forward in grace. And so Paul is constantly writing saying, hey, here's a problem that you could have or a problem that you do have. Here's how to fix it. And he starts out by saying, therefore, each of you must put off falsehoods. Now, what's the therefore, therefore? 
Anytime we see a therefore, we've got to stop and say, what's it there for? Well, previously he writes about, hey, we want to be a people of love. So if we're going to be a people of love, you must what? You must put off falsehoods and speak truthfully to your neighbor. For we are all members of what? One body. We are all members of one body. Now this is huge. If we're all members of one body, all right, then we have to go, what? Paul's goal is the body of Christ. Paul's goal is to say, hey, this is what's priority. And so now he's asking, what's best for the body? What's best for the, the body? Lauren, you want to do next week? Or you want to do next week instead? Or you just want to go ahead? All right. She's <laughs> well, I'm glad you made it. So Lauren's going to set up and do some painting over here. Uh, and she made it through the snow to get to us. So thank you, Lauren, for coming in. All right? So Paul says, hey, well, the body of Christ is what's important. And when people look at who we are and how we live, all right, we want them to see a change. And then he moves immediately not into, so everyone should go tell your neighbor how much Jesus loves them. He also doesn't move into, therefore, repent. It's fascinating that when Paul talks about the priority of the body of Christ, he then moves immediately into, in your anger. It's like Paul knew me. I'm just saying, maybe not you, all right? But Paul knew me. And he says, in your anger, do not sin. In your anger, do not sin. In your anger, do not sin. And turn to your neighbor and just tell him, in your anger, do not sin. Now, this is a big deal because what Paul doesn't say is don't ever be angry. Why? Because anger is a reaction. Anger is a reaction. So Paul doesn't say don't be angry. You, ever, you know someone who takes the whole concept too far and they're like, hey, if you love Jesus, you should never be angry? Okay, that's not where Paul's at. Paul's saying, look, in your anger, when you get angry, don't sin. You're going to get angry at times. That's just because you're, you're human. He says, but in your anger, do not sin. And then he moves on to probably what's even more difficult. He says this, all right? He says, do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. I was listening to Jeff Dunham last night because I was really bored trying to go to sleep. And I was, I was like, I want a little laugh here. And he said this, he goes, yeah, my wife and I go to bed angry a lot because we're tired. <laughs> and I thought, I've, I've done that. What's Paul wanting us to know here? He says, listen, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on you while you're still angry. Why? Because it gives the devil a foothold. Ultimately, what Paul's saying is, is you and I can't what? Stay angry. He's like, look, anger's not wrong, but you can't stay that way. You can't stay someone angry. He said, in fact, by the end of the day, you and God need to figure out how to go, but it's okay. I'm not going to live what? I'm not going to live angry. And you know why this is so big a deal, such a big deal? You may not know this. It's because you and I can't be trusted with anger. Do you know that? You and I can't be trusted with anger. God is perfect. God can be trusted with anger. But you and I can't be trusted with anger. Why? Because when I'm angry, I do dumb stuff. Am I the only one? I, there's other people here? Okay, let's try it again. You, you say, so let me just help you out, okay? A little, uh, help, a little bit of training. So when the pastor says something that, that you don't want to say amen to, because you, uh, amen means and may it be so, all right, you don't want to say, and may it be so, I, I'm angry too, right? That's not what you want to say. You can say, come on, all right? You can say, my grandfather used to say, preach it, preach it, with a low voice up front, all right? So, so we'll try it again, all right? All right? I can't be trusted with anger because when I'm angry, I do dumb stuff. All right, just, I thought maybe I was alone for a second, okay? I'm just saying when I'm angry, I do dumb stuff. I, 
I punched a hole in the wall. And you know what's really dumb about that? Is then I got to fix the hole in the wall. Yeah. And I, I do even more dumb stuff because sometimes I vent my anger on the wrong people. Again, I must be alone in that one. Right? I'm just saying that I sometimes vent my anger on the wrong people. Because somebody says something to me when I get home, one of the kids, and it's like, what are you talking about? And all of a sudden my brain goes, why are you so angry at them for asking you that they want something to drink? You're not really angry about that at all. You're angry about this that happened earlier today. And I hurt the relationships that I want to safeguard the most because I do dumb stuff when I'm angry. Here's the good news. God's perfect. God never does dumb stuff. In fact, God doesn't ever react. We'll cover more of that in a moment. So what is the cure for anger? I had someone this week, we were talking about it, he goes, well, don't be angry. I said, no, that's not the cure. Paul says in your anger, you're going to get angry because you're human. The cure for anger is called forgiveness. It's hard to say, even harder to do. Listen, if we only forgive others when they deserve it, because this is the argument you get, right? Well, I'm angry with them. Well, forgive them. Well, they don't. They didn't even ask for, try it again, they didn't even ask for, right? In fact, I don't even think they care that they hurt me. So what does Jesus say? Forgive them anyways, right? If we only forgive people when they deserve it, we're never, what, mimicking God and therefore obeying Jesus. In fact, we live in disobedience. Jesus. That's no good. So if we only forgive when someone deserves it, all right, how many of you struggle with this? All right, I do, all right? Why? Because there was an injustice, and that person should be held accountable. That person needs to know that they were stupid and dumb and should have their head kicked in. Right? No, I'm sorry, just kidding. Got a little angry there. Listen, we got to follow what God teaches us. Romans 5, 8 says this, but God demonstrated his love for us that while we were still sinners. Now, it's interesting. There are some people who translate this that while we were still his enemy. And either way works. And the basic point here is that God forgave you and I our sins upon the cross before we wanted him to. Before we asked him to. Before we even knew we needed Jesus to do that. While we were still working against God, God forgave us. And so if we're going to behave like Jesus, you and I don't have room to say, well, they haven't asked for it. Well, they don't know what they deserve. Well, I'm punishing them for a little bit longer with a silent treatment. Whew. What's Jesus say? Hey, if you're going to be like me, you need to learn to forgive and forgive quickly. In fact, don't let the sun go down on your anger. Don't give the devil a foothold in your heart. Because anger is like a poison that reaches to the entire body, both physically, as we talked about, and emotionally. So what do we do with it? If I need to forgive people quickly, here's a little secret I'll teach you that I learned. People are stupid. Did you know that? People are stupid. Yeah. In fact, people are stupid. And the way to think about this is uh, people are going to upset you in the body of Christ. And I say people are stupid knowing that I'm one of us. Amen? Right? I was telling one of our kids who Josh just got his license, I said, you know, you always got to be defensive driving, but I never want to yell at the guy when he messes up because there have been too many times where I'm the guy that's messed up. And I hope that person's giving me grace, too. Like, they're not flipping me off and cussing me out because I went, hey, I thought it was green. Sorry, it was kind of purplish. Right? But people are going to upset you. And in the body of Christ, Paul says, look, 
People should look at the church, and when people get upset in the church, they should look and go, you guys seem to handle that differently. And we go, yeah, because we're all sinners saved by grace, and we're all working it along. And therefore, when someone bumps you at the coffee bar at church, it should be handled completely different than at Starbucks. Now, I'm not saying you should handle it different. I'm just saying that two people who are working to follow Jesus are going to handle that completely different than someone not working to follow Jesus. Because when that person bumps you and two people are following Jesus and they turn around, they're going to say what really quickly? I'm sorry. I, I, I'm an idiot. It's also acceptable there, right? I'm sorry. And then you're going to turn around and go, why would you do that? Now I have coffee all over me and it looks like I wet my pants. No. Because I follow Jesus and I learn a pattern, a habit of forgiving quickly. And it is a habit. I'm going to say, I forgive you. I need you to walk in front of me the rest of the service. Now Listen. We at church should be practicing grace on a regular basis. This is why when you see churches fighting over stupid stuff, and we do that, I know it's shocking. This is why it's so ugly. It's because the rest of the world knows that we should stand for something bigger and that the love of Jesus and the grace of Jesus Christ should allow us to behave different. And when we don't, even the outside world looks and goes, you don't match your, your leader." We've got to learn to forgive and forgive quickly and often. Wait, what, what about Aaron? You don't know how bad he hurt me. I don't. But you and I don't get a vote to hold that against him. But Aaron, you don't know. I don't. And I, my heart will break when you tell me the story if you tell it to me. But all I'm telling you is that you and I don't get a vote to hold a grudge. Our vote's gone. Why? Because Paul said, what? Don't let the sun go down on you while you're angry. So how I think through this is this. I stop being shocked when people mess up. Think about this. On a regular basis, you're angry at someone who is repeating a behavior that you're angry at all the time. And in your head, you say to yourself, I can't believe she, he, Bob, Joe, Susie did that thing. They always do. Like that's what's going on in your head. You are literally saying that. Uh, it's just the, the, your coworker. Uh, you know what? They always smush my lunch in the lunchroom. Now I, I got mine in the fridge. It's got my name on it. And every time they just cram their stuff in, and they do, and they do it every day. And I'm so angry. And I would stop right there and invite the Holy Spirit to say, well, "Why are you angry?" And why can't you believe that Susie does what she does every day to your lunch? Are you going to be angry every day for the rest of your life? Why does it shock you that this happens? Change the system and stop being angry that the regular thing that makes you angry happens every day. Think about it. I can't believe, put your person's name in there. Do you got them? Nod your head if you're like, yep, I know exactly who. Don't say your husband's name out loud, all right? But I can't believe blank did that thing they always do. Actually, that's what I expect them to do. And therefore, I'm not going to be a, at least as angry because why? I was expecting that type of behavior. Did you know this? If you don't let go of your anger, you are staying in an unhealthy relationship with that person in your head. It's like you've given them rent in your mind and said, hey, here's free space. Live there. I'm angry at you. Right? And some of you have held that grudge. And every time you saw that person, you're like, oh, I hate them so much. And that other person probably didn't even know that they bothered you. They are living rent-free in your mind and in your heart, and it is poisoning every part of you. Why? Because you can never what? Truly live in grace when you're angry and hating someone. Right? So what's the cure again? We already said it. It's forgiveness. Ephesians 
Just later on in the passage, Paul says this, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as what? Just as Christ forgave us. But I don't want to forgive. You don't get the vote. Jesus said forgive, but it's not easy. That's true. But you don't get a vote not to do it. Why not? Because Jesus commanded it. Forgive as Jesus forgave us. So pause. Why do we become angry? This is really important. A lot of people are just angry and they don't ever stop and go, why am I angry right now? This is called kind of emotional health. There's two main reasons that we become angry. All right? One of them is that something all right, is not as it should be. There's an injustice, an inappropriate thing, or something insufficient. And in, you see how it's not as it should be. And this is the world we live in. We live in a world where things are not as they should be. That's the story you and I get in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve chose sin. There's all kinds of, 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 of cataclysmic disasters that follow as we live under the curse. Things are not as they ought to be. And therefore, we're angry. And did you know that there's a righteous anger that can motivate you to do great things, but that you can't stay angry and do the right thing? It has to change from anger to love. William Wilberforce is a great example of this. We have someone who encountered all right, the slave trade in England. All right, and he's watching this go down, and it started out as anger in him. This is injustice. This is not right. This is inappropriate. This is not the way God made it. This is not how things ought to be. But if William Wilberforce had stayed angry, slavery, at least under his leadership, would never have been abolished in England. Because angry is an inappropriate, inappropriate motivator that can't be sustained. You die often before anger can get to the place where it fixes a big problem. Instead, William Wilberforce, life was changed by what he saw, and the anger motivated him to do the right thing out of love. Now we're being motivated by what God's heart is. And it took him almost his entire life His entire life motivated by love to do the right thing and accomplish the right thing. Now, on the other side of that is what I want to just admit that this is where I fail. I get angry because something didn't happen the way I wanted it to. There's a righteous anger that I go, that's not the way it should be. And now I'm motivated and I got to go, I'm going to go help fix that. But then there's the anger that just goes, I didn't get what I want. Like sometimes I go to the fridge and somebody's eating the last chocolate bar. That's no good. Right? And then I'm angry or sometimes hangry because it didn't happen the way I wanted it to. I can't tell you how many times in our relationship that I've suddenly felt anger rising inside of me with Sarah or with my kids, and also my brain pauses and goes, is this because of something that happened earlier today or just because something didn't happen the way you wanted it to and this is out of selfishness? Ouch. Did you know that often if I just run through my filter like that, about 90% of what I was going to do and say doesn't happen? It's a really great filter. If I pause and I just go, I'm angry because didn't happen the way I wanted it to. My brain shuts down a lot of stupid stuff. I'm just going to invite you. You can try it. All right? I'm angry because. Because why? Because it didn't happen the way I wanted it to. So the idea is that there's godly anger through God. All right? Though, though, though God doesn't feel emotions. But there's godly anger that motivates us to, to fix stuff. Now, Again, I just wanted to pause right here because in the Bible it often says that God was angry, God's angry, God's angry. And, and we got to pause and say, we're trying to use human words to describe God. Because I heard someone a couple months ago use this as their excuse. Well, it's okay to be angry because God's angry. And I went, well, it's okay to be angry not because God's angry, but because we're humans 
but we can't stay angry. And they said to me, well, God's angry. Why can't I stay angry? And I went, because that's not really correct about God. Think about it this way. Anger is a reaction to a problem, right, or a situation. Anger is a reaction. Everybody with me? Nod your head if you're with me. Okay. God knows everything. He knows the future. It's impossible for God to be reactive. Think about that. God never reacts. God, God, nothing happens and God goes, oh, I didn't see that coming. I'm really ticked. It can't happen. God knows everything, right? And so nothing ever happens where God goes, I didn't see that coming, right? And so when the Bible describes, again, God's anger, what it's really describing is this is not how God wants it to be. This is why you and I can't be trusted with anger. God is never motivated by anger. Every act of God is an act of love. And so again, anger gives the devil a foothold in our life and allows him to come in and begin to change our heart. So what should we, we, we can get angry, but we then got to move from anger to love. First John 4 says, dear friends, let us be angry with one another just as God is angry with us. No. He says, dear friends, let us love one another. For love comes from God. And everyone who loves has been born, you entered a new life, and knows God. But whoever does not love does not know God. All right, just a couple more thoughts for you. Ready? There's two inappropriate ways to deal with anger. There's the explosion of anger. And this is where you take a two-liter bottle and just sit there and shake it. And shake it. And shake it. And you all know this person who just kind of blows up on you all the time. Right? And so you come in and you're like, hey, how you doing? And, and it's like they took the lid off the two-liter bottle and just... <laughs> and you walk away going, I'm not sure what just happened. I said, how you doing? And I got hit with all the, the anger, right? But then on the other side, there's the anger repression. The person that bottles it up. And again, what happens when you bottle it up? It eventually blows up again. And so both of these ultimately lead to unhealthy thinking, unhealthy lifestyle. Uh, there's a, a psychologist, his name's Robert Sapolsky, I think. Someone else may correct me and tell me, hey, you're clueless on how to say this guy's name. But he writes this. It's really interesting. He says, did you know that humans are the only creatures that have ulcers? His book, Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. Okay? He writes and he says, here's the way life works. If a lion's approaching a zebra, okay, that zebra kicks into fight or flight mode, just as you and I do when something wrong happens or when we're scared or when we're angry, all right? Our brain goes into fight or flight, and there's a fight motion, right? And he says this. He says, it's about 30 seconds. That's how long fight or flight lasts, or at least should. He says that zebra's got about 30 seconds before they should get away, and they're either safe or they're being eaten. And that's how God created us. He goes, God created us about 30 seconds worth of that adrenaline rush where other systems shut down, other systems take over. we got 30 seconds to get away. But he says, but human beings are the only species that remain in that heightened state of alertness and fight or flight. And it causes all kinds of medical and mental conditions, including ulcers. And that's why he wrote the book, Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. And he says this, he says, you know what, you and I actually stew on an anger issue over and over in our head. And what do you gain from it? Bitterness, right? Because you and I aren't figuring out how to forgive that person, we're figuring out how to justify what we did and how to cause harm for that person if we're angry. When we move into love and forgiveness, we begin to think, how do I care for this person? How do I begin to solve the problem? So i got to confess to you real quick. I struggle with anger still. I mean, I, I, I read all kinds of books several years ago going through a lot of anger troubles as, as all kinds of what I believe are injustices occurred to me and my family. And, and, and I just want you to know, God hasn't brought about justice for much of that. 
And I, I can't bring about justice for my family. And so you may be sitting there going, yeah, Aaron, but you don't know what I've gone through and how angry I am and the fact that God still hasn't set it right. And so what do I do about that? Well, we go back to Scripture. We read Romans 12. What's Paul say about it? He says, don't seek revenge. Don't seek revenge on your own. He says, but give God a place for him to bring about justice. For it is written, vengeance is the Lord. So when you say to me, but you don't know what he did to me, and nobody's bringing about justice. And I hear the hurt in your statement, and I go, I get it. But we do have a God who promises one day there'll be justice. But it is not mine to carry out. Why? Because I can't be responsible when I'm angry. Only God is responsible, truly responsible when there is an injustice. So, is anger bad? Just a couple thoughts. Ready? God did not create us to be angry. Did you know that? You weren't created to be that way. You were created to identify a situation, go to anger, but Paul says, don't let the sun go down on you while you're angry because you can't stay. You weren't meant to be angry. Long-term, anger results in all kinds of troubles, mental and physical. You and I can't be trusted with anger. And anger is not the answer, but it can alert us to what needs to be fixed. So what do we do, Aaron? Well, there's no quick fix. So what do we do when we're angry? We give it to God. And when we pray, we reason it out with God. We give it to God. We ask God, what action would you like me to take? Maybe we need to talk with a counselor or a godly leader, all right? But what do we do? We need to find something else that will occupy our mind, which is where we turn to Philippians 4.8. In fact, we call it the Philippians 4.8. Paul says this, if you're angry, if you're, you're struggling, if you're sad, if you're heartbroken, listen, think about these things, brothers, whatever's true, whatever's honorable, whatever's just, whatever's pure, whatever's lovely, whatever's commendable, whatever's excellent. If there's anything worthy of praise, think about this. So when you're angry, your brain's stuck on a loop. And Paul says, stop the tape. He says, just stop and go, this isn't what God's called me to think about. He's called me to think about other things. And then finally, we need to learn to forgive like Jesus. I promise you it won't be easy. It'll take time. It's a process. It's a process of healing maybe some stuff from back in your childhood that really set you off with a short fuse. Or previous relationships. Or previous hurts and injustices that have happened to you. And that's why you're actually angry all the time and it's just waiting like a time bomb like the shaken up two liter bottle for someone else to say something but forgiving and living in love is the best way to live and if we as a church don't want to address how we deal with anger and ask God to transform us through grace we are failing each other